some longtime friends uh, who are joining us today and, uh, and lots of new names too. So welcome to everyone. My name is Jean Herb and um, I co-direct the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center, uh, as well as direct a center of research and practice at the Rutgers Blaustein School. Um, this is one of a series of webinars being given by the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center um, as part of our Summer Climate Academy. This session is titled Protecting Our Historical and Cultural Assets, and we're really happy that so many people um, have chosen to join us today. Um, this, um, this session is going to be recorded, and the, um, the recording will be up probably by next week on the Climate Change Resource Center website, along with the recordings of the rest of our, um, our webinar series. So welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, other than today's presenters, who are Kenny Clark and Dominique Hawkins, and our Rutgers team, you're all muted. So to communicate with us, you have to type your questions into the chat box. Um, since we've all been home and quarantining since March, you probably know how to find the chat chat box. But just in case, if you hover your mouse on the bottom of the screen, you'll see a series of circles that are displayed and one looks like a dialogue bubble. When you click into that, it'll take you to the chat box. What we need you to do is to type your question or comment into all panelists. And that way, my colleague, Carrie Ferrero, Dr. Carrie Ferrero, will be able to monitor the chat box um, and we can see what your comments and your questions are, and we'll make sure that we can address um, as many of them as possible. Today's webinar will run till about 1.15. Um, for those of you who have not joined any of our webinars, um, please indulge me to take one minute to explain the newly formed New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center. The center is housed at Rutgers and was created by a new law that was signed by Governor Murphy in January. The purpose of the center is to uh, support the use of impartial and actionable science and evidence to advance government, public, private, and non-governmental efforts to address uh, climate change here in New Jersey. The center is intended to conduct applied research, create planning tools, develop technical guidance, and undertake pilot projects and provide practical support to practitioners like yourselves. Our mission is to connect actionable research, evidence, science to policymakers, planners, practitioners, the media, community, students, preservationists, and other individuals through outreach training and education. Um, so we are just tremendously thrilled to have Kenny Clark um, and Dominique Hawkins joining us today uh, for this presentation. And we have left a good amount of time for questions um, from, from our participants. So thanks for all of you for joining. Uh, Kenny Clark is a GIS specialist with the New Jersey State Historic Preservation Office, where he coordinates cultural resource GIS development and other information management initiatives. Since Hurricane Sandy, Kenny's been actively involved with a variety of resilience, disaster planning, and climate change in initiatives for cultural resources, resources such as the New Jersey Cultural Alliance for Response and statewide hazard mitigation planning. Kenny works with the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions as a trainer for the Commission's Assistance and Mentoring Program, which supports local historic preservation commissions nationally. Kenny's received his Master's of Historic Preservation from the University of Georgia. Um, Kenny will be talking first, and then he'll be followed by our colleague, Dominique Hawkins, who is a principal with Preservation Design Partnership, a planning and design practice focusing on nationally significant historic site buildings. Dominique is nationally recognized for her pioneering work in developing design guidelines for historic communities and districts throughout the country, as well as elevation design guidelines for historic properties and flood mitigation guides for historic properties in New Jersey. She holds her master's of science degree in historic preservation and architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so before I turn it over to Kinney, I want to remind you that if you have questions or comments or you want to share um, information or a thought, please put it in the chat box and make sure that you send it to all panelists. And um, before I turn it over to Kinney as well, I want to just um, note that if you had been on a um, WebEx with me last week in my 1870 historic home, um, you would have seen um, 
walls that were not painted. So if you're a frequent comer to our webinars, I want to point out my beautifully painted walls today. So, um, so it was a busy week. Uh, so I'm very pleased to turn it over to Kinney, um, who will talk for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll turn it over um, to, to Dominique. And I'm really looking forward to these presentations. Kinney? And um, what I what we wanted to talk about today was just sort of the, some of the things that we've been doing at the HBO since Sandy in the in the activities we've uh, focused on around these topics of climate change, sea level rise, and, and hazard mitigation. Um, for those of you not familiar with our office, we're in the Department of Environmental Protection and in the Natural and Historic Resources Group. And we administer a variety of programs around historic preservation uh, and cultural resources. Um, and really, all of, almost no area of our operation was untouched by Sandy or by sort of what we are foreseeing as the need to plan for and deal with uh, cultural resources in the face of climate change. Um, but first, what are the historic resources that we're talking about? Well. We generally follow the guidance of um, the National Park Service that were defined in the National Historic Preservation Act uh, that, that says that historic resources are buildings, structures, objects, and sites, um, or collections of those types of resources, as known as districts, that form their own identifiable entity. Um, and sites can be both archaeological sites, either historic or uh, uh, Native American sites, as well as design landscapes and other kinds of uh, places where events might have happened. But in all, for all of those resources, uh, they need to have, uh, be of a certain age, have integrity, and, and have a, a level of significance. So age is pretty straightforward. Things that are 50 years old or older are generally considered, uh, when you begin to consider them as historic resources. Integrity means that they have uh, the design characteristics um, that convey their, you know, from the time period for which they might be significant. And significance is the sort of the broader area of how you evaluate a cultural resource. Um, and again, these are defined by uh, the National Register uh, program under the National Historic Preservation Act. These are the general criteria that we use. And the key point here being, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them, but, but they're out there. If you want to look them up, you can, you can read more about them. But the key point is that um, the determination of something that is historic and significant isn't uh, an ad hoc thing. It's really based on research and documentation and, and, and trying to sort of articulate why this place is uh, of, a, of a significance that makes it worthy of, of preservation. Um, so, you know, while the Historic Preservation Office has certainly had involvement in various kinds of uh, disasters and or flood events over the years, it really wasn't until Sandy that, that we the scope and the breadth of the impact of Sandy sort of crystallized for us that we need to do a better job at understanding how all these kinds of events and, and climate change are going to impact cultural resources going forward. Um, so we, we were immediately kind of thrown into this sort of broad based effort to deal with the Sandy recovery, but then also to look at sort of a more holistic way at, at what we're going to do. So we, we've in 2012, when this happened, this was the state of the art. And it's, as Dominique has pointed out uh, to me previously, this, um, you know, the laws and regulations around the flood insurance program and flood claim management has changed several times since Sandy. And so this is, um, this is outdated now. And you, your best guidance is really going to be from websites, from the resources that others have prepared, that, that Dominique has prepared, and the work she's doing around the country. Um, but one of the key things we took away from this is the, the floodplain management uh, issues was a whole body of regulation and administration that we just had not been actively involved with and needed to change that and come up to speed very quickly. And one of the key things that we noticed was that their definition of what historic is doesn't quite map to what the larger cultural community defines as a significant historic resource. And so awareness of that gap was really critical to our interaction with the various programs associated with this. 
Now, the National Flood Insurance Program and the local is administered at the local level with a flood damage prevention ordinance. Um, and that coexists with local government's ability to de designate and regulate uh, historic districts and landmarks. So in a lot of communities that we work with in our local government program and our certified local government program, they, in the aftermath of Sandy, were struggling with how to deal with the adaptation and the, and the response to the storm and elevations in their districts, um, absent good guidance to do that. So one of the first communities to kind of proactively take a look at this was Beach Haven. That we uh, were able to fund a revamp of their design guidelines to deal with elevation and provide examples and how you work with uh, elevations in their local district. Um, but the, the, the local administration of both floodplain management programs and uh, local preservation issues can create some real difficult decision making when it comes to historic resources uh, that are at risk or need to be adapted to deal with uh, resiliency. And Dominique's gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but we worked with uh, Dominique and her firm to, to develop really more broad-based guidance for the state of New Jersey. Um, and so I won't say much more about that now, but at the same time, the state has a statewide preservation plan. And in that document, which we did, it technically ended in 2019, but we got an extension so we can deal with some other things before we have to, to redo it. And we're gonna be working on that in the coming year. Um, in that plan, we really only had one statement about resiliency and or sea level rise and dealing with cultural resources. So we know that going forward in, the new, in this new plan, we're gonna to have to have a much more holistic look at, at uh, this issue and these issues. Um, this is a picture down in Holgate and it's, it's a really interesting, I love the contrast here that you've got the developed beach you know, holding the line at one place, but the natural beach up there to the north is really where the beach wants to be. Um, and that kind of highlights sort of the dy dynamics that we're working with here. Um, right after the storm, we spent a lot of intensive time looking at what's on the ground uh, to make determinations with FEMA. Um, the point I wanna make about cultural resources survey, um, and we, we covered uh, almost all the coastal counties with FEMA doing this, and in this effort, we were looking for where there was low potential for cultural resources, which was a bit of a switch for us. We kind of had to turn our turn our heads around a little bit to, to do that. But we successfully evaluated uh, a lot of the coast and, and streamlined recovery funding into these areas that FEMA did not have to come back to us for review uh, when they were implementing the recovery funding. Um, but the key point is that we know that we don't know where everything is what all resources are out there. So doing good documentation and survey of cultural resources across the state is vitally important, especially when you're not in the midst of a disaster or a proposed development or a proposed highway project to, to get that understanding. And if you're in a position to do that, we strongly advocate that you, you know, go out there and work with your community to identify and document your historic resources. Um, one of the places we looked at in this wind chill survey was Monmouth County. You can, uh, in Seabright in Monmouth County, you can see that it really had never been evaluated. My pointer show up here, but it's this area here. It had never really been evaluated as a historic district. And during the wind chill survey, we saw that there was a significant amount of historic fabric there, but that in the midst of the recovery, a lot of that fabric was changing very fast. These houses were being elevated to be protected. A lot of them were substantially damaged during the storm and had and were required to be elevated by the flood plain management ordinances. Um, and you begin to have this real contrast. And so we're not sure that that district would have survived today as it did, and we do need to get back out there and look at it. Another place, similar issues. This district was identified previously, Ocean Beach Historic District in uh, <clears throat> down in the Toms River, just above Seaside, uh, along the shore there. Um, you know, very small scale cottages for middle class housing at the beach. And before, before the storm, you saw a very uniform appearance to the district. And then similarly, after the storm, you see um, a very different picture. And, and that's why design guidelines are so important to help sort of manage that change, because we acknowledge that that change needs to happen if these places are gonna be safe. Um, another organization that formed right after Sandy was the Cultural Alliance for Response. This is based on a National Alliance for Response model. Um, it's the only statewide model in the country. Um, and uh, it takes an even broader look at cultural assets 
and involves uh, organizations and, and individuals from the uh, forming and visual arts communities, from libraries, museums, archives, um, as well as historic resources and historic places. So it's a very uh, good cross-sectional look at ways to plan for and prepare for uh, disasters and sea level rise for all of these communities, and then forms a network for response when something does occur. Um, we also were very involved in, uh, as, we, as we looked at our, our survey information across the state, we realized that one of the places that did get impacted but didn't benefit from some of the recovery funding was Cumberland County. And the Bayshore there had never been comprehensively surveyed. So we committed to doing a multi-year project to survey the Bayshore region. And this is the survey area here down in southern Cumberland County. Um, that project is almost done. We're trying to put the final touches on it now and get that reporting done uh, to get that out there to share that with the county and the communities there. Um, and it was, it's a fascinating, it's been a fascinating exercise because it's the first time the office has done in-house survey in a long time. Uh, so we've been developing some new techniques and methodologies, but we're also uh, racing against uh, other mitigation activities like the Blue Acres program, who is buying up and clearing um, at-risk places uh, to set them aside for uh, open space uh, and remove people from harm's way uh, and property from harm's way. So as these communities are being bought out and cleared, we're also trying to document them and maybe even going back and looking at some of the documentation they prepared as part of that process so that we can understand uh, for those that survive and that might get invested in to protect, you know, how do they, how do we evaluate them uh, in relation to um, those that are, that are lost. And, and so Cumberland County has been a really interesting exercise for us um, and one that we hope will have the resources to uh, continue in other places in the state. Um, and finally, you know, I'm, I'm on vacation actually right now. I'm out in Michigan, in Holland, Michigan. And as I'm walking the dog this morning, this is what I come across, you know. So this isn't just a coastal issue. This is, this is everywhere. Um, the Great Lakes are at seasonally at record levels uh, for their seasonal elevations. Um, and so the spring floods this year were on top of the uh, levels last year that didn't recede over the winter like they normally do. So you're starting to see these changes happen, you know, both inland and, and on the coast. So um, that's really mostly what I wanted to cover today. And I'm, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll stimulate some discussion and we can kick it back uh, later on. So I'm going to stop sharing. Mm -hmm. And thanks, Kenny. Thanks so much, especially for joining us while you're on vacation. Um, oh, my pleasure. Well, thank Thank you so much for that for that overview. Um, so I am um, so pleased to have the opportunity to turn this over to Dominique Hawkins um, from the Preservation Design Partnership. Um, and then what we'll do is um, after Dominique's presentation, we'll open it up for um, questions, comments, discussion. Um, and just as a reminder, if you want to offer a comment or a question, please uh, put it in the chat box to all panelists. Please note that um, we here at Rutgers uh, through the Climate Change Resource Center are really keeping track of the kinds of chat comments that we get to help inform our future programming. So uh, keep that in mind. So Dominique, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, so taking off from what Kinney was mentioning, um, I just want to give a little context as to how I came about working in flood mitigation um, for historic properties. So one of the things that I do a lot of, oh, here we go, excuse me. One of the things I do a lot of is design guidelines in various communities. And historic communities tend to be located next to water. Um, principally, that's because that's where early settlements happen. That's where you have transportation, commerce happening, um, food source. Um, so historic communities tend to have a waterway in them in some way. So I worked in I worked in New Orleans post um, um, Hurricane Katrina and was watching what FEMA was doing. And then as I was moving around the country, I was starting to see 
the beginnings of flood mitigation, sort of a spotty approach to flood mitigation an issue. Um, in 2015, um, post Sandy, I was approached by the state of Maryland to do a project, which we weren't sure exactly what it was going to be, but some sort of a guide to help local communities address flood mitigation. And with that, I took the nosedive in and haven't turned back. So in looking at the communities and their relationship to water, one of the things we have to remember is that a lot of the historical connections to water have been, I'll say, covered over, paved over, cultivated through. So in thinking about some of your favorite historic places, sometimes it's really helpful to go back to an older map to look at where the waterways were, because that's where the water wants to be versus where it is today. So this is a map, for example, of New Jersey, 1889 and present day, both showing rivers, streams, and creeks. And they may not be at the equal levels of detail, I agree, but um, thinking about um, 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 the streams and the creeks and how we've diverted them and, and you know, changed their path will help you understand even how inland flooding happens. We think a lot about coastal flooding. Pennsylvania has one of the highest rates of flooding in the country. Um, it's clearly an inland state. Water, water everywhere. So this is New Hampshire. Um, and, and water is an integral part of historic places. Um, and this, this example, they actually dredged um, this waterway because it was threatening Exeter. Coastal flooding is, is what we all think about. It's the hurricanes. So it's the big storm that's coming in, um, and it's usually uh, also accompanied by very high winds. So there are other issues associated with big storm flooding, and it is both a question of rising water as well as pushing water. We've heard the, the phrase um, storm surge, and what that is is waves um, pushing against the shoreline. So the height of the waves goes um, up much higher than what is normal. Um, and the acceleration of that can, can be devastating at the bases of buildings and literally knock them off their foundations. Um, ice is another problem that we have to uh, deal with. Sometimes on the Delaware, you'll see um, uh, big sections and chunks of ice flowing down the river. Ice can, can back up in, um, in under bridges, et cetera, and the residual of that will also cause flooding. And inland flooding um, tends to be um, what's called riverine, which is, which is from the river, or uh, severe storm-based. So if you have an instance where you have a, a lot of rain happening over a short period of time, or the ground is saturated, or you have a significant ice or snow melt, you can actually get inland flooding anywhere. Um, so, uh, this is, these are some of the, the photos taken um, in New Jersey by the show post um, uh, Sandy. And as you can see, the effects of flooding can be horrific. And many, although we think about flooding really hurting buildings, what we really, I'm going to challenge everyone to think about what it means for a community. So thinking of preservation of the sense of place in addition to a building per se, or even a collection of buildings as a uh, historic district. So residential flooding is really divided into, in terms of the regulatory framework, into two um, different things. One is residential um, issues and the other is commercial. So, so the work I did for New Jersey focused much more on the impacts on residential um, but I'm currently doing a lot of work on commercial buildings, so um, I can speak to both, but I'll focus mostly for this presentation on the residential side of it. Again, force and impact of, of, of water. Um, so in the commercial sense of it, in addition to being disruptive, whether it be nuisance flooding um, um, on a waterfront that um, uh, doesn't allow you to drive in a certain direction. It also has a big impact on 
um, the ability of a commercial center to operate and, and it has the effect of closing businesses. I mean, think, you know, COVID, every time there's a high, high tide, you know, once a month. So in, in a lot of commercial centers, the impact of flooding also um, means that, that the businesses can't operate, which means that they're losing income, which means that um, uh, their town is not being successful. This is an example from Ellicott City in Maryland. And if you recall, Ellicott City in two years had, had two back-to-back 1,000-year -back storms where the storefronts were literally blown out of the historic core of downtown um, twice in a row. So this is a, another shot of that impact of water. So Ellicott City is an inland city located on a stream or a creek. And I'm not sure which one, so I apologize. But there was there has been so much development upstream of Ellicott City, then what it has done is channeled um, the water um, in a way in a hard surface, which caused it to um, basically accelerate. And the volume of water was so high that it actually um, entered Main Street and blew out many of the storefronts. And there was actually loss of life associated with that. Flooding also has a, another long-term impact. So this is a this is a main street at the western end of um, it's actually in Western Port, Maryland, and uh, this was Main Street. Um, so behind the tree line that you can see behind that single building is actually a creek that flooded, and it took out Main Street. So what that ends up meaning is that all of the businesses and all of the buildings along here got flooded. So FEMA came through and offered everyone buyouts so that they can, um, um, you know, recoup some of the money, but prevent them from building there in the future so that it increases the uh, flood resiliency of the town. Well, the impact of that is there's no longer a place to buy, to, to buy your groceries. Um, there's nothing there. I think there was a, a pizza shop. Um, but, the, but the result of losing the main street means that the community as a whole has been devastated. So how or why did this happen? What's going on? How can we protect it? So, so Kinney mentioned that um, um, one of the ways that, um, uh, one of the places we can get information is actually from FEMA. Uh, FEMA runs the flood, in, uh, flood insurance program, the National Flood Insurance Program for the United States. And there are, um, since the publication of the guide that he pointed out, which, which does have some good information in it, FEMA has changed the rules. And currently it's a requirement for all um, FEMA insurance policies to uh, uh, be rated in a way that it actually protects the federal government from loss. So historically, Historic houses were basically grandfathered at a very low insurance premium. In 2012, there was a Bigger Waters Act was passed, and Bigger Waters says, you know, we as the National Flood Insurance Rate Program have been spending so much money um, um, in payouts to uh, uh, for flood insurance that we're losing money. So we want everyone to pay market rate for flood insurance. Well, the reality of paying market rate for flood insurance um, uh, put everyone into a panic. In 2014, that was revised to slowly get everyone up to market rate. So currently, every year, everyone's getting a, a hike in their flood insurance premium to get up to market rate, which is causing homeowners to say, wait a second, I have to do something because I can't keep paying these rates and they're only going higher. So, so how can I mitigate that? So building elevation starts. So on the right is a lovely little historic house. On the left is a FEMA compliant house. There are two of them actually. And one of the effects that this has is taking, taking a community and really architecturally um, altering it. Um, and in some places beyond recognition. The two buildings to the left are, are new. The one on the right, obviously old, uh, 1920s. Um, this happens to be St. Augustine, Florida. But in addition to um, 
sort of changing the sense of proportion, you have also lost the connection of the building to the streetscape. So what is the process of building elevation? Uh, so the process of building elevation is literally picking up the building, uh, putting it on cribbing, raising it to uh, the desired height, reconnecting all the plumbing, the electrical, um, sewage, and everything else, and uh, building a new foundation to that height, and then dropping the building down. The incremental cost of building a foundation that's four foot high versus eight foot high is negligible. The cost of actually doing the elevation is, is where the expense lies. So picking the building up initially is where the expense lies. So as a, as a property owner who wants to stay in that location, it is in my best interest to go high enough that I can gain bonus space under my building, um, particularly my house, by raising it at least eight feet. So what can I do in that lower area, which I know is flood prone? I can park my car, highly desirable in any beach location, and I can also store stuff. So the beach chairs, the barbecue grill, whatever you know it is I want to store. Um, the challenge for uh, local communities is to balance how can I protect historic buildings and protect the lives of the people who live in those buildings and their property with historic character. And the design guidelines for the uh, state, the elevation design guidelines, attempts to, to put that framework in place in a way that local communities can make choices. Another option for buildings is to um, uh, relocate. And this is only really possible when you um, have a piece of land that can accept the building. Um, those who, who have studied preservation understand that relocation can sometimes change the historic context of the building and therefore make it Ill, ineligible for um, uh, continued listing on the National Register, for example. So if I have a beachfront house, um, with a view of the beach, and that is a connection, you know, the big brand of porch facing the beach, et cetera, and I relocated three blocks from the beach, the building may be saved and, and you yeah, know, in a safer place. However, I might have lost that context, and therefore it is no longer eligible for listing. So it's this strange, you know, like, you know, how, you know, how do you navigate those, those waters in terms of making choices? And every situation is unfortunately different. But the, the mechanics of relocating a house are similar to lifting it, meaning you have to get it up on cribbing, and then becomes the added layers of you have to physically move it. So it's somehow either uh, put on a flatbed or on a series of flatbeds if you're cutting it apart. Um, and then you have to get it to another site, which means that you have to be able to pass the roads under the trees, under the electrical lines, over or under the bridge to relocate it to the site, prepare that site, and then drop it on a new foundation to roll up those buckets. So one of the other issues that the uh, municipalities are facing is that they, they, they have to figure out how to manage water in a way that um, allows them to become more flood resilient. Um, one of the issues is that municipalities choose how they manage their own zoning and impervious surface coverage is one of those. Um, when I saw this article, there was part of me that was surprised and that there was part of me that wasn't. So 81% of the Jersey Shore is paved. So if the water has nowhere to go, it's going to um, be flowing either into the bay or it's going to be flowing into the ocean. Um, because there's nowhere for it to be absorbed. If it's flowing off the landmass, then it is contributing to the overall um, increase in the height of that water mass. So some of the other things that are affected by transportation, or excuse me, include transportation infrastructure. As I mentioned um, with the ice 
ice jamming as a means of flooding. You can also have debris jamming on bridges. Um, and if the bridges is, are servicing as a way for you to get from point A to point B, um, and it's backing up and flooding over, you're going to have an issue. And also, historic bridges, as lovely as they are because of their construction, may also be more vulnerable in terms of being something that can be maintained if you're trying to mitigate flooding. So if this had been a, a single span, you wouldn't necessarily get the debris uh, backing up on it. So in, in looking forward as to some of the things or some of the better things to do, or, or some of the things that you have to consider is that a lot of what Flood mitigation is, is local, it's locally regulated. So uh, municipalities are making choices for their own place um, in an isolated way. And each municipality has a floodplain manager and the municipality may be a city, it may be a county, so it just depends on where you are. But the municipalities are making floodplain decisions. And as they are making um, these floodplain decisions, um, and they're allowing or not allowing development or, or uh, changes to occur in their municipality, they're actually affecting other municipalities. So in addition to that, regulation in each place is different. So what may be an acceptable means of mitigation in one location, i.e. elevating a building to a certain height, may not be acceptable in another municipality. And, and that may be because of historic reasons, it may be because of other reasons. So it's really a challenging puzzle in terms of trying to untangle it. In looking at where we are going towards the future and, and how to think about the intersection of preservation in the sense of saving community and, and flooding, we have to look at what are the key factors that are preventing or, or allowing us to be in a place. So one of them is transportation. Can you get there? So if this, if this series of roads to get to that island in the horizon gets flooded, what does that mean? The people who live on the other end can't go to school. They can't get to work. They uh, can't transact business and, and are becoming more and more isolated. So this may occur at first in an intermediate basis, but as the flooding gets worse, they, became, they will become more isolated and more separated from the mainland, whatever that is. This, is. this happens to be in Maryland on the Chesapeake. Another issue that is occurring is, is way of life. So as the, as the brackish water begins to intrude more and more into um, uh, the land mass, what occurs is, yes, the trees, the, tr the old stands of trees are dying, but it also means that other ways of life, including things like farming, dependent on you know, certain soil conditions or, or wetland conditions, um, are changing to address um, what, the, what the current uh, flood situation is. So as the farmers have to leave because they can no longer work their land, you're also starting to impact what that community is. So what do we do? So at first we start by, by, by doing little things. We start saying, okay, we're gonna modify our behavior. And modifying our behavior may mean on certain days we don't drive down certain roads because we know that on high tides that certain roads are going to be flooded or, or you know, we might have problems getting through or we don't park in certain areas. Um, we can modify our behavior in a lot of ways and accept the fact that, you know, just like in New Orleans, you keep rubber boots in your desk drawer and if you have to go somewhere, you can get there. But the other, the other thing we have to think about is that some places aren't going to be saveable um, for very much longer. Um, so Kenny showed the great shot of the oyster, the oyster, um, um, and, and then you think of oystering and crabbing and some of these things that the watermen do. 
some of those industries are actually dying off in certain places. And as those, as those industries start to shut down and close, the question becomes what happens to that place and what happens to the story of that place? Because in, in the reality is, um, as, the, as the community starts to dissipate and they don't have the services there, will the place, how will we remember the place is, is the large question to ask. And so as preservationists, are we starting to think about looking at flooding as a, as a wake up call to say, maybe we have to adjust the way we're thinking about what we're preserving and how we're telling the stories. Is it in a building or is it in a larger context of telling about the people who live in a specific location and the community that they share? So this is a house in, in, in the Chesapeake and it's called the last house on Hopper Island. And I think you can understand why it's the last house. Um, so we, in many ways, are, are facing this, this challenge, this race against time. Um, and what we are trying to show is that, is that I think there, we've come to a, a fundamental shift in how to think about preservation as it relates to things like natural disasters such as, as, as um, flooding. We can't necessarily keep the status quo and be precious about keeping everything the same. We have to make choices about to what extent we're willing to accept change and how we're going to be responsibly telling the stories of the places we are. So in, the, in sort of my journey of this work, I have created, um, I've written three different publications at this scale so far. The first being the one in Maryland and then the two um, for New Jersey that were previously mentioned. The one in Maryland really looks at, and, and then actually the first guide for, for New Jersey really looks at how we can use the, the regulatory framework that the federal government has established how it's implemented in the states and how it can get translated down to the local level. One of the big challenges with, with flooding is that the, the principal agent in it is actually FEMA um, and FEMA speaks their own language. One of the things, one of the challenges I had was that I had to develop a cross, uh, excuse me, cross glossary to um, understand this information because FEMA, the Army Corps of Engineers, and architects and preservationists all use the same words in different ways. And as you start to get into um, reading these publications and understanding the impacts that they have on the thing that you care about, you have to be able to understand the language that everyone is speaking. I think as preservationists, we have to understand fundamentally that Army Corps and FEMA are not going to come to us to solve, to solve our problems. We have to meet them and understand how we can fit into the way they work if we want to save the places that are important to us. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank, thank you so much both to Dominique and to Kinney um, for those great presentations. Um, just as an aside, both Dominique and Kinney and some of uh, Kinney's colleagues from the State Historic Preservation Office joined a class of uh, graduate students um, of Rutgers that I participated in um, uh, last, um, last month. And we talked about the role of uh, preservation as part of resilience work. And most of these students were students in the STEM fields. And uh, it was really eye-opening to them. They, they hadn't really thought about uh, for our students um, because they're very focused on coastal resilience and uh, resource protection. So it was uh, really amazing to bring this uh, conversation into the larger discussion regarding resilience. I guess one question I would start off um, both to Dominique and, and to Kinney is, whether there are some innovations from a policy perspective in other locations, whether that's cities or states, that um, you're particularly excited about that you might point to for, um, for the participants on the webinar. Um, 
So Kinney actually mentioned Beach Haven, uh, New Jersey as an example. I think Beach Haven is doing fantastic things. So some of the, um, so one of the things that Beach Haven did, as I mentioned, preservation is local, as is floodplain management. And they've managed to look at some of their early elevations and were disappointed that people were going for that eight foot elevation, for example. And instead said, we are going to um, limit the height that you can raise your building to, I believe it was two feet above the base flood elevation. And what the base flood elevation is, for those who are less familiar with the terminology, it's, the, it's, the, it's called the 100-year floodplain, which you should never use, the special flood hazard area. It's the, it's the line that's um, sort of um, understood by FEMA as at the highest level of flood risk. So by limiting the height of their building elevations, they actually counteracted that by giving a, a, I'll say, a zoning bonus to allow people to build a freestanding garage on their property. So they managed to really balance this, the disproportionate elevations with something that people wanted and were able to work with their city council to get that approved. Oh, wow. Any other innovations you'd want to point to beyond Beach Haven? So that makes me really happy because that's where I go on vacation every year. Kenny, I think you're on mute. Yep, there we go. Okay. <laughs> No, I think Beach Haven was the one that, that comes first to mind. And I'll just relate, I live in Cranford, New Jersey, which was affected the year before Sandy by Hurricane Irene. And we had a similar issue with zoning issues for elevations, properties being elevated that were hitting up against the, the height threshold under the zoning rules. And so they had to do a quick adjustment to zoning to deal with that. So there's a, I, th I think in a lot of ways, you know, it's just, Dominique mentioned this local, the local issue really is is paramount and and that, they have you know, communities have to think about these things holistically it, as they rework their zoning codes and all of their local regulations up around these issues um, to allow for the flexibility for this to happen. You know, for, for people to adapt if adaptation is the choice. So one of um, the, one of the things to keep in mind is that um, there's a word that gets thrown around in flood talk. It's called mitigation. And mitigation means a lot of things, but in, in the flood world, what it tends to mean is, is um, an alteration that improves your resilience. Okay? There are two levels of mitigations. There are those that can happen at the community scale, and then those that can happen at the private property scale. So something like a building elevation is a private property choice. So somebody is spending money out of their pocket to do something. Communities can also do very large scale choices. You know, the big example is New Orleans has all these levees. Army Corps is not building any more levees. So that thought has to sort of leave everyone's minds, but there are things that, that local communities can do to improve resilience. The combination of community mitigation measures and private property mitigation measures work together. So it has this increasing benefit to the overall, you know, region if, if, if both things are happening simultaneously. Private mitigation measures are somebody, you know, either through their own financing or through some sort of a grant financing gets money to do something on their own property. And sometimes that's, that's usually public-private funds. Um, Community-wide, it takes a really long time to get that, those actions through um, through a process. So you have to, you know, if you decide that you want to make land wetlands again, you know, that has been either developed or, or somehow impacted and, and turn it back to wetlands, it takes a long time to work through a process. Some communities are actually doing um, beneficial things where they're using these community activities to also create a benefit um, for their community. So example, change it to wetlands, but let's put a path through the middle of it so people can observe, you know, birds or hike or, you know, go on a run, right? So there are ways that, that some of these community mitigation measures can have multiple levels of benefit as well. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. And um, before, before I turn it over to the chat box, I guess I have one more question. So I have the 
prerogative um, as the moderator. Um, just looking at some of the pictures that both of you posted uh, brings to mind something that we talk a lot about in the climate change um, conversation, which is a conversation about um, equity um, and, and the issue of um, affordability and the issue of access um, to, to resources. And um, as I look at some of those pictures, I, I guess what immediately comes to mind is, is whether this is another um, area of uh, climate change adaptation where equity um, it, you know, raises an, an issue as well in terms of who has access to be able to um, both make their communities or their structures or their landscape resilient um, and at the same time preserve their, the character. So I, I, I wonder whether that's an issue um, in the in the preservation field. For either one of you. Well, I'll scream yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things that I have I have learned, and, and principally I think it was acute in New Orleans, is those with the most money live on highest ground, where there's a. <laughs> those who can move to higher ground. I mean, people in Miami Beach are now moving to, you know, they're displacing residents to move to higher ground to stay on Miami Beach. But um, historically, underserved, under underrepresented um, or minority or financially challenged populations will always accept the land they are given. That tends to be sort of lower ground and more vulnerable places. Um, one of the challenges that communities face when dealing with flooding is if you look at the economics of flooding, um, it, it sort of exacerbates an already often dire condition. So a municip municipality that may be, I'll say, financially challenged because its residential or its tax base isn't but so high, who's also dealing with high degrees of flooding, has the challenge of needing, I will say, huge investment to improve their resilience and they're the least able to, to do it. So as mm -hmm. properties get flooded out, for whatever reason, if people choose not to return or choose not to improve their properties and just let them disintegrate, so to speak, each one of those is a tax payer who's not paying taxes anymore. So the community is not benefiting from those taxes, which means that they are not funding their police, their fire, their schools, their you know resiliency projects, their raise the sewer treatment you know plants higher so it's not flooded out. Because if any of those those fragile relationships break, the community breaks. Thanks, thanks, Dominique. Kenny, I don't know if you want to respond to that. Sure, I just want to say that I think. Sorry, the dog's here with me. I, we want to. <laughs> This, this, we, we're seeing that exact thing in the Bayshore region of Cumberland County, where you know these lower economically uh, generating communities are are really struggling, and especially in areas that were largely already held in open space or or wildlife management areas that you know they're rateables. As they lose these small Bayshore, Bayshore communities, it has a much greater impact to their revenue than uh, than it might in other places. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so so everyone, I see we have a bunch of really amazing questions in the chat box. I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Carrie Ferraro, um, who's been monitoring the chat. And Carrie, if you wanted to raise a couple questions coming in from the chat box. Great, thank you, Jean, and and thank you so much, Dominique and, and Kenny, for a wonderful presentation. Um, our first question comes from Margaret Waldock, um, who asks. Um, if you could speak to creative ways uh, that we can think about public access to his historic communities and ways to tell stories and remember those places that we can that we cannot save. Um, she also in a kind of related question asks if recreation trails you kind of spoke about this before Dominique um, provide some opportunities to connect and interpret these places. I'll take it Kenny if you want. Uh, sure yeah go ahead I'll jump in after. So an example of a community that has, um, I'll say, flooded out to the point it displaced all its residents is Fort Smith, North Carolina. It's currently being run by the National Park Service and, um, and you, you can't get there most of the year. Um, but what they do is they have a homecoming for the residents who were there, you know, and the families who were there. Once a year, they bring them over on boats and they, 
they um, have a celebration on the island, the picnic, and then they, by the end of the day, they go back. So there are some efforts to say that this place is still important to this group of people, it's just not safe to be here. Um, and I'm probably gonna get the name wrong, but I think it's Ile, Ile de St. Charles in Louisiana, which was a Native American settlement um, where it is just getting sort of swallowed up little by little. They're literally trying to move the entire settlement to another location. There are some people who do not want to move. So they're trying to maintain the sense of community, the challenges, people, you know, their place is their place, and they just don't want to relocate. You know, I, we haven't talked a lot about, we've talked a lot about architecture, we haven't talked a lot about archeology, span but archeological resources are equally at risk to, to sea level rise and coastal erosion. And I think in Florida, they have a great um, public archeology span program where they train citizen archeologists span to monitor at risk sites. And so over time, as the, as the sites are, are eroded out of the landscape, they're monitoring and documenting. Um, so they're not doing full-scale excavations here, but they're just keeping tabs on it and, and collecting the information that those sites contain um, as it happens and as the, as the uh, environmental processes change the nature of those sites. And I think it's a really innovative program, very interesting, something I think we would like, we, we should explore in this region as well. So actually, um, the, Maryland has been doing that as well on the uh, Eastern Shore because they're, they're running into problems along the Chesapeake Bay. So they're training citizens to at least, um, you know, collect the objects, noting where they collected them or take a picture so that there's at least some reference point to it because recognizing it just, they can't save it. Right. What, what cool programs. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so our next question is from Matt Campo. Uh, he asked if there were other local regulations or state regulations that you were surprised or maybe your clients were surprised needed adjustment in order to enable uh, adaptation aside from zoning and building cone design guidelines, for example, ADA, ADA accessibility, parking, things like that. Uh, yes. <laughs> so one of the one of the projects I did a similar, um, I'll say a small design guideline project I did was for Fells Point in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and Fells Point's the inner harbor. Um, so it's a lot of two to three story brick row houses. A lot of them have commercial on the ground floor. And there is this balance. Um, and sometimes, honestly, you can't sort of fix it all. Um, Annapolis, Maryland, um, their, their harbor, they have such frequent and terrible flooding. They're actually looking at the potential of doing a boardwalk system or a walkway system connecting buildings um, at the rear so that you can get access to buildings even when the floodwaters are higher. Um, but there is starting to be a greater acknowledgement that we cannot, we're not going to hold on to everything. It's just not possible. We can't, um, the, the rate of flooding is increasing so much on the Chesapeake Bay, they're into anticipating a 2.1 foot rise in sea level by 2050. Add on top of that storm surge, um, which also has, happens in, in the Bay, it's, it's, there's a lot of places that won't be there anymore. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Zoe Linder Bapti, who asked if the presenters could speak to the challenge of incorporating new, modern, more modern design choices like rain gardens, permeable pavement, and solar panels, and having to follow historic preservation guidelines. Sure, I, I you know, I think all of those kinds of, of strategies for uh, adapting and making building, you know, architecture more resilient are on the table. And the, you know, preservation guidelines are fairly flexible in the way that you can, can implement those kinds of techniques and design those, those kinds of amenities for uh, and around historic buildings and historic areas. Um, you know, in, in some ways we talk about, you know, historic preservation design guidance as, uh, um, uh, a, a lot of gray zones with very few absolutes. And so it's just a really a balancing act on how you integrate those kinds of features 
Uh, but we know that you know buildings have to be used to be viable, and and those if, if, if making those kinds of changes can enhance that viability, then we you know certainly look to seek to find ways to do that. So I'm a strong proponent of energy independence post storm because the reality is the building will recover a lot faster if you have power. Um, one of the challenges associated with new construction in the context of, of flooding is that any new construction has to meet current FEMA regulations. So if you recall the image I showed from St. Augustine, which had the little house and the sort of very tall houses next to it with garages at the ground floor, that meets FEMA regulations. So if there aren't, um, if the design guidelines don't carefully balance the historic context with what is a appropriate new construction, you can get stuff that's really out of whack. So the buildings didn't need to be that tall. They wanted they wanted the garage, and it's not that I'm blaming them, but that's you know that's what they got. That's really interesting. So Carrie, I think we probably have time for one more question. Wonderful, thanks. Um, so our last question is from Zachary Davis. He has a question re, um, regarding the NJDEP regulations. Um, the flood hazard area permit issued by NJDEP does not consider the effects of that permit to historical historic properties. Excuse me. Any possibility of expanding the review by NJDEP for FHA permits to include effects to historic properties, given the relationship between climate change and threats to historic properties. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> oh that, so that is a wow. That is a wow. And, that is a wow. Add, and I would add too that we, you know, we do know that under Governor Murphy's executive order uh, 100, we can anticipate um, changes to um, some enrollment here in New Jersey too. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Dominique and Kenny if they have any thoughts on this. I, I'll say, you know, I can't, I don't know that I can speak to specifically to whether that permit will ever adequately consider historic resources, but, you know, the permitting rules in general to varying degrees do include historic resources. Um, you know, not all obviously, but, but some do. And, and I think just what we've seen in, in the last five to six years is that cultural resources really have risen on the radar for a much larger uh, constituency at DEP and others in state hazard mitigation plans in ways that it hasn't been before. So that I do anticipate that will continue. Um, we were asked for the first time, I think, you know, ever for our comments on the statewide hazard mitigation plan. Um, we had never been asked before, even though it's had a cultural resources section for many, many years. So, you know, we see the trend is that yes, more inclusion and more acknowledgement of cultural resources and a lot of this decision making will occur. How and when and how long it's going to take to make those changes, that's you know a much bigger question. So one of the things I would suggest is that you actually look towards uh, the variance process because typically uh, the exclusion of historic buildings from the um, from the requirements is part of a variance process. So it may not be literally on the form, it may be a variance application. And I'm not sure for the state of New Jersey. I haven't looked into it. Great. Um, thanks. thanks to both of you. So just a couple things that I want to note um, before we um, we close the, the webinar is for today. The good news is that um, in partnership with the state Preservation Office and Preservation Design Partnership, um, the New Jersey Climate Change Research Center will be offering two more um, webinars um, with SHPO and with um, Monique, explore in greater detail these issues associated with uh, preservation and um, with climate resilience. So you will want to make sure that um, you have um, signed up to receive emails from the Climate Change Resource Center and, and the, the website is, is typed into the chat box um, and you probably noted that you want to receive information about future events. Um, so keep, keep your eyes posted for that. Um, what I'll also note is that this um, a recording of this presentation will be up on the website um, over the next several days. And for all of you who registered, we have your email and we'll shoot you a, um, an email to let you know 
when the recording is available. A couple of the things that I will um, give you a heads up on is that we do have a couple other uh, presentations that are on the calendar. Uh, on Wednesday, it's the second um, part of a two part series on connecting issues associated with climate change, uh, COVID restart and rebuilding and equity. Um, so that's on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, um, for all of you who have an interest in issues associated with um, preservation and planning, you will may want to participate on Thursday because we will be walking you through some new and improved um, data tools and data visualization and mapping tools um, pulled together by Rutgers, which includes uh, lots of data on climate, um, but also lots of data on other assets. And so those might be some practical tools for you to, to you know. Um, the last uh, current webinar that we have scheduled is a week from today, and that uh, focuses on engaging socially vulnerable populations into climate resilience planning. And, and, and all of those are listed on the on the Climate Change Resource Center website. Um, so please feel free to visit, and there'll be additional ones coming up um, over the course of the summer as part of the Summer Climate Academy. Uh, please feel free to shoot us an email if you have suggestions on additional uh, topics that you think that we should be covering. Um, so I just wanted to turn to Dominique and to Kenny to see if they have any final words that they'd like to offer. Dominique? Um, my puppy's getting excited. So, <laughs> um, so um, one of the things I saw in the chat box is the, um, uh, the uh, CRS. Um, uh, yeah. I just lost my acronym. Um, community rating system. Um, so yes, I will say can in fact be impacted by the community rating system, which is a higher degree of compliance than firm maps or than, than floodplain regulations typically require. Um, so every, I, it just stresses the fact that local governments really control both flooding and preservation. Those two departments never really speak. Um, and, and I think it behooves us as preservation professionals to learn their language and speak to them because they're not gonna come running after you. Their issues, you know, they're, they're, they don't necessarily um, consider preservation as a priority. And to follow up on that, I think we've had a few CL certified local government communities, which is a partnership between the National Park Service, the states, and the local communities to pass through some of the historic preservation funding that we get. Um, they've asked us about better ways to deal with the community rating system and local uh, preservation issues. And so it's something I think we're gonna be working on more as they develop their local planning documents and try to establish better dialogues between um, those two communities. Wow, that's really interesting and something to look forward for and maybe a good topic, Kenny, for a future webinar. Sure. Um, so um, thank you so much, Kenny Clark and Dominique Hawkins for joining us today. And thanks to everyone who participated and joined us. Um, as part of this webinar series, again, um, keep an eye out for, uh, we'll shoot you an email when there's a recording and then also for additional um, webinars as part of the Summer Climate Academy um, that'll be coming up. Um, so uh, thank you to everyone and thank you to Matt Drews and Carrie Ferrero for helping to, to staff uh, today's event.